Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off the Charts Football Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Spratt from Sports Info Solutions, and I'm joined, as always, by Aaron Schatz of Football Outsiders. Uh, it's been two weeks since I talked to you, Aaron, and I feel like a, a lot has really happened since then. Definitely thank you to Greg for filling in for me last week. I thought you and he did another great job. Um, but now that we're back, I just want to pepper you with a bunch of questions, Aaron, and let's get started actually with your team, the New England Patriots. There are a lot of elite teams this year that are sort of struggling or dealing with injuries, and it's kind of gotten to the point where there's the Patriots and then there's everyone else, at least in terms of public perception. But what I found really interesting in this week's DVOA update is that the Patriots are actually only ranked fourth, and they're behind the Eagles, the Cowboys, and the Broncos. Can you explain a little bit about why the numbers don't quite match up to that public perception, and maybe if there are things in that that mean... That, that are sort of explainable, maybe it is clear that the Patriots are, in fact, the best team. What are your thoughts? Right. You know, I wrote about this in the article on Football Outsiders, uh, which is, you know, the reasons why Philadelphia is one and why New England is four. I mean, the first thing to say about this year is what I've been saying all year, which is there are no elite teams, or at least there haven't been over all eight weeks of the season. Uh, you know, it's a weird year where everybody seems to be imbalanced. There don't seem to be any teams that are good on both offense and defense, or at least have been for the whole season. And as a result, everybody's really packed close together. There's a lot of parity. Philadelphia is number one with a bit of a gap between them and the rest of the league, a lot because of special teams and the fact that they have two kick return touchdowns and nobody else has a single kick return touchdown. I do think that's a little bit of a problem with the system because of the way kickoffs changed this year because those touchdowns have become even more valuable compared to average than they were in past years. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, even if you change that problem, Philly's still number one. They're just back in the pack with everybody else. Uh, as far as the Patriots, I mean, it's just about the first four games of the season. So, you know, I wrote uh, the first couple games of the season that we actually do not have the Patriots with a positive rating in either week one or week two. Based on DVOA's equations, the Patriots were slightly outplayed in both of those games despite winning them both. Yeah. Then they played big against Houston in week three, horrible against Buffalo in week four. But since Brady came back, wow, they have been amazing. They've been like 41% above average which would, would be one of the top dozen ratings ever through week eight if we only look at the Patriots in the last four weeks. So in the last four weeks, the Patriots team that's on all of our minds from the last month, that team is an elite team, and that team is far ahead of the rest of the league. Although I should point out, Dallas has also been better in the last four weeks than they were before that, although in Dallas's case, that's only three games. Right, right. So, I mean, obviously Brady is a big part of that, and you had some really interesting stats looking at the Patriots' offensive DVOA splits with Garoppolo, Brissett, and Brady. But another big part of it is, at least since the first two weeks of the season, the Patriots have really improved defensively. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, and then we'll pivot into to Jamie Collins specifically, but what has re been responsible for the Patriots' defensive improvements? You know, it's hard to tell what is causing... Uh, the change in how the Patriots are playing on defense. Uh, there definitely have been personnel changes, but the interesting thing is that the personnel changes came in week five, not in week three. So week five really is the marker for the Patriots overall. I mean, it's when the offense and the defense change. And while the Patriots defense, uh, you know, is like 11th in the league since week three, it's like eighth or ninth in the league since week five. Okay. Yeah. So that was the week that Ninkovich comes back from his suspension. And all of a sudden, you are not getting a lot of Shea McClellan. <laughs> and Shea McClellan is not very good, and I don't quite get what they think they're doing with him. It's one of the worries about the college trade is that it may lead to more Shea McClellan. So McClellan played 35% of the snaps in three of those first four games, 60% against Miami. Then all of a sudden, he's not playing at all in weeks five and six. On the other hand, the other is a Freeney. Jonathan Freeney got hurt. On the other hand, you see the emergence of the rookie Elandon Roberts. Elandon Roberts, six snaps on defense in the first four weeks. And then all of a sudden, starting in week five, he's playing 50% of the snaps, then 75% of the snaps. And then in the last couple of weeks, less than that. 
but you're seeing Collins stopped playing 100% of the snaps in week five. All of a sudden, you're seeing Roberts and you're seeing Ninkovich. And, and that's where a lot of the changes came for the Patriots. The weird thing is, like I said, that it's week five, not week three, when there's personnel changes. So when we're asking ourselves, you know, what changed in week three, the answer is not really as obvious. Nothing. Well, I mean, so the stat that I that I have here is that the Patriots were um, 30th in the, in the over the first two weeks and pass pressure generated by their defense and are 17th since then. It's possible that I just chose sort of a bad time to look at that. I bet if I made the split in week five instead of week three that they would still be, you know, one of the bottom five teams in the league for the first four weeks and then a much improved team since then. So, I mean, it's clear that they've been making improvements, at least in getting to the quarterback. But this Jamie Collins thing, I know we've seen it a bunch of times before where, where Belichick has traded a player that is maybe not necessarily a star, but like a big name defensive player. Um, this is kind of another one of those instances. But the thing that's really surprising to me about this is it doesn't really seem like the Patriots got a lot for him. So the, they netted a, a compensation pick that's going to probably be a third round pick in the 2017 draft. And if they had just let him walk at the end of the season when he's a free agent, they probably would have gotten a similar pick in the 2018 draft. So same sort of range one year later. What am I overlooking here about what the Patriots are are seeing or maybe what they're deciding to do here to let Collins go? Um, Seems like a really big part of their defense, although I know there's been a lot of things kind of coming out that maybe there were unrelated to the football problems going on there. I feel like this is the part. We're going to talk about Jamie Collins. I feel like I need to insert that the Off the Charts podcast is a freewheeling conversation <laughs> that touches on mature subjects. And uh, uh, listener uh, guidance is is advised. Yeah. Earmuffs <laughs> ear to the young kids, in other there words. There may be swear words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't get it. Nobody got it. Nobody understood why they did this. All of Twitter, no one understood so I'm not going to pretend that I'm any different from anyone else that I don't understand what they did here. I'm not going to say, in Belichick we trust, everything he does is perfect. I am also not going to say, like somebody did on Twitter, uh, that an analytics company would run an NFL team better than Bill Belichick does. I certainly don't think I could run an NFL team better than Bill Belichick does. That doesn't mean I can't question this move. Okay, so what is in it for them from a team-building perspective? Like, let's forget about the chemistry stuff, right? Yeah. Okay, Ben Volan wrote and argued that the issue is that by getting picks a year earlier, they are developing players faster to get them on the field and useful earlier in hopes that they get value out of guys while Tom Brady is still great. Okay. Right? So now the pick that they get for... Collins, that guy's a first-year player, second-year player before Brady retires. The problem with that argument is um, you would add Collins for this year, and he is a Pro Bowl quality player right now, and Brady is awesome right now, and you're trying to win the Super Bowl right now. The other argument I got is that this frees them up to use money on free agents next offseason. Because getting the compensatory picks is based not on who leaves, but on the sort of value net of who leaves versus who you sign in free agency. And if they allowed Collins to leave in free agency, but they signed big name free agents, then they would not receive compensatory picks for him. And therefore, this guarantees that they get a compensatory pick. Probably the the assumption here is they're going to end up with the pick that Cleveland gets related to Alex Mack going to... Atlanta, but the pick hasn't been given yet, and therefore it's a quote-unquote conditional. I, I don't know about that either, because this is not a team that tends to spend big in free agency. So, so the Patriots... that just leaves you with chemistry questions, and that's where I don't know anything, because I'm not in the locker room, and frankly, even the people in the, who cover this team in the locker room don't seem to know what's going on. So the Patriots do have some other big free agents on their own team coming up at the end of the season. So it, I understand how they could be a financial burden for them. Do you know off the top of your head, Aaron, if they re-sign their own players, does that sort of affect the, comp- the compensatory pick? Um, like, no, I believe it only matters for external guys, the right? that they add from other teams. And, I mean, obviously that's the biggest reason behind this is that they made a decision Collins was gone after this year. Uh, 
and that that they will prioritize Hightower and Malcolm Butler and possibly Martellus Bennett, although I can't imagine that they would give him as much money to be the number two tight end as another team would be would give him to be the number one tight end. But uh, still, there's no explanation. I mean, if they get rid of him at the end, then fine. You know, do what Dallas did two years ago with DeMarco Murray, which is get as much as you can, can, can get out of the guy and then let him leave in free agency. There's got to be something here where this is an attempt to to send a message to the team uh, chemistry-wise, or they felt like, maybe they felt like um, because of the, you know, he's not doing certain things correctly on certain plays, they felt they were going to do what they've done the last couple of weeks, which is sort of play a Landon Roberts in one set of situations and Collins in another set of situations. And then perhaps there's a fear, if we're not willing to play Collins 100% of the time, is he going to try hard or does he have some kind of a, personality flaw where then he kind of gives up i don't know the answer to any of these questions i do know that it's hard to tell if michael lombardi was sent out into the world to badmouth collins either because the patriots people that he's close to in the front office wanted lombardi to do that or because lombardi thought that he's belichick's buddy and he should defend him and say this stuff but maybe belichick didn't tell him to and belichick doesn't believe those things. Like, we have no idea of knowing this. Uh, Dan Shaughnessy did an interview with Collins where he said, uh, you know, Collins said, you know, the team is, you know, attacking me. But it's actually not the team attacking you. It's a guy who worked for the team once upon a time and is close with some people on the team attacking you. And you don't know if he's doing it of his own opinion or if he's out there kind of, you know, being, you know, what Rudy Giuliani is to Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Like he's the, what, what do they call it? The surrogate. Sure. You know, is Lombardi the surrogate for Belichick? I, I realize I'm talking more about this than I would about most player moves because I'm a Patriots fan. Uh, and um, I'm sure that the two of us would also get into it this much if we talked about how Cam Newton doesn't get penalties called on him the way other quarterbacks do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your team. We would. But, but uh, yes. yeah, no, nope, I don't get it either. Yeah, I hate to be sort of Patriots and Panthers all the time, but like the conspiracy theorist in me wants to draw a connection to this from this to Josh Norman because these were both two moves that I didn't really understand where it didn't seem like there was very much penalty for just keeping the player while they can help you. And I don't know, maybe I'm just somehow overvaluing how much the the next year is in terms of a player's contribution if they're not a long-term asset. I just don't know. It seems really confusing. And clearly that did not work for Carolina. Obviously not. Uh, we'll be and coming the, back the to other, that. By the of. way, the other move that I would put in the same basket is Josh Sitton. Yeah. Getting cut right before the season by Green Bay, where it was like, is this really going to make you a better team by cutting him? I mean, I you know, I mean, of course he's hurt now for Chicago, but it's it's he was still a really fine player, and that seemed like such a strange move. Not as strange as the Norman move, but still. I don't get I don't get these. So you know that the Josh Norman thing is partly because Dave Gettleman simply does not value cornerbacks in the way that most general managers do. Perhaps this is Belichick setting the message that he doesn't value linebackers in the same way that other teams do, except the contract they give Hightower is going to be the opposite of that. Yeah, and it's one thing to choose not to sign someone to a big contract, and it's another thing to release them or trade them before – like their current contract is up. It's like it's not like the the Panthers needed that Josh Norman money; they didn't spend it. And it's not like the 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 Patriots are currently struck with some sort of financial difficulty. It's more like they're just planning ahead in some way that we can't really understand. But anyway, it's no, we interesting. We can understand. We just don't think that we just we all have a different opinion of the value of having okay. that Fair. pick one one year earlier. Most people believe the value of having Jamie Collins. Even if Jamie Collins is not playing 100% of the snaps, that the value of having him playing 50% of the snaps and the value of having him around in case of injury rather than having to plug in Kyle Van Noy, that there's more value there than there is to getting a third round pick one year earlier. End of the third round, by the way. Yeah. Well, maybe some, some more will come out about it, but we should probably change topics before we, we spend the whole show talking about yes, the college let's trade. talk about teams. Let's talk about the teams that are most likely to keep the Patriots from making the Super Bowl. I like it, because actually we wanted the next talk about the Kansas City Chiefs, and we talked about them a little bit before, I think just sort of as a part of a whole when we've been talking about how great the AFC West has been this season. Um, 
But like the, the Chiefs struck out to me really this week for a couple of reasons. One, you mentioned in your DVOA article that one of the reasons the Eagles are the number one team in DVOA is that they had that just huge win over the Steelers back in week three. They won 34 to three. And with only a half season in the bank, you know, that sort of win can really outsize the overall contributions. Sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have the Chiefs who the following week actually got blown out by the Steelers, 43 to 14. The Chiefs are now up to 10th in DVOA overall. And Aaron, I was wondering if that Steelers game, if you just kind of threw it out, would the would the Chiefs suddenly be one of like the best five teams in DVOA, if not even higher? Number two. Number two, wow. If you take out that game, the Chiefs are the number two team in the league. If you take out both Pittsburgh games, so both the Pittsburgh blowout loss to Philly and the Pittsburgh blowout win of Kansas City, yeah, Kansas City is the best team in the league. Wow. Man, the Steelers are really swinging destinies this year, it seems like. They really are. <laughs> now, of course, look, that's not reality. Sure. Okay? Like, that game happened. The things that happened in that game, we learn from. But let's imagine that instead of this ridiculous loss – the Kansas City had just had a kind of big loss, right? Instead of minus, uh, instead of minus 112 DVOA for that game, we'll give them minus 40 DVOA yeah. for that game. Now they're the seventh best team in the league, and the third best team in the AFC. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, it seems really possible that the Chiefs are one of the the elite teams, such that any team is really elite with this sort of parity NFL. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is a better idea of where they are. Not what they would be if that game had never happened, but what they'd been be if that game was like a two or three touchdown instead of like complete and total annihilation it was. And then on top of that, don't forget, they're about to get their best defensive player back. Yeah, Justin Houston. I don't know how healthy he'll be, but their pass rush has suffered. And with him back, their pass rush should absolutely improve. So we think the Chiefs are a very good team. Plus, a lot of things have kind of been working out in their favor of late. They're actually 5-2 and two on the season, so they're only half a game back of both the Broncos and the Raiders. So it's not like they're not in the race in the AFC West with some of those other really good teams. But they've also won three straight games. And their next three games are home against the Jaguars, at the Panthers, and home against the Buccaneers. Those seem really winnable to me, too. So, I mean, you're almost looking at 7-3 and three or, or better coming up for the Chiefs. So, like... It seems like they're in a really good spot. Where do you see them in terms of their, their playoff um, percent chances of making it right now? Well, so here's the interesting thing about Kansas City is that their next couple games look super uh, super easy, right? Yeah. But actually over the course of the season, they have the eighth hardest remaining schedule because they still have not played Denver. So they have to play Denver twice and San Diego and Oakland. So... Tennessee is better than most, you know, gen- we think of Tennessee, we think, oh, AFC South. But that's yeah. the best team in the AFC South. It is, yeah. Right? So they're still on their schedule. Um, so so uh, Kansas City's schedule going forward is not as easy as San Diego's. Uh, and it's even slightly harder than Denver's, although the main reason it's slightly harder than Denver's is because our ratings have Denver's. You know, the better Kansas team, City has yeah. to play Denver, but Denver only has to play Kansas City. Gotcha. Um, I, I think that, look, I think it's really likely that three AFC West teams make the playoffs, right? It's really looking right now like AFC North, you got to win the division to make it in. AFC South, even though there are two teams that, you know, Tennessee's 4-4 four and, four and Houston's 5-3, and three, Given how well they've played so far, you've got to expect that those teams, that at least Houston has a losing record the rest of the way, which means, you know, it's likely you have to win that division to make it in. So at that point, it comes down to AFC West teams or Buffalo or, if they can go on a little bit of a hot streak, Miami. And I just don't see it happening with Miami. And Buffalo, I just... Every time we talk about them, I say the same thing, which is I just don't know what to do with them because it's so. If they seem to make so little sense. The offense is good, and then all of a sudden it's struggling, and then and Rex Ryan's running a good defense, and then the defense is not so good. But you know, Buffalo has Seattle this week, and they're probably going to lose in Seattle. But when they come back from their bye week, right? Four of their last seven games are at home, including three home games in the freezing cold in Buffalo in December, which include Cleveland and Miami. Right. You know, Pittsburgh, should, you know, is good, but Miami is okay. Cleveland is terrible. The other home game they get is Jacksonville. 
So if they win three out of those four games and then win at the Jets in Week 17, they're definitely wild card contenders. So I think I think it's pretty much down to the top three AFC West teams and Buffalo. And that that definitely seems to jibe with what the Football Outsiders playoff numbers do suggest. So the Broncos are at 83 percent, the Raiders are at 71 percent, and the Chiefs are at 68 percent uh, chance to make the playoffs. And then if you jump down. The Bills are at 31%, the Bengals at 26%, and the Ravens at 22%. Right, but see, the thing is that the Ravens and the Bengals' chances of making the playoffs are almost all about the division. division. You're right. So what really matters is the wild card chances. And so the wild card chances are 38% or more for the three AFC West teams, then 29 for Buffalo, 16 for Miami, 14 for San Diego, and everybody else is below 4%. So the real wild card race here is just whichever teams don't win the AFC West and Buffalo and Miami. So obviously the the schedule, at least after the next three weeks, could be something that derails the Chiefs. But injuries could also be something that could cause problems for them, specifically because they're dealing with a lot of things right now. Um, Both of their top two running backs are out for this week. Spencer Ware has a concussion. I guess he may not be officially out, but it's expected that he'll be out. And, And Jamal Charles actually got placed on IR with his knee injury. Meanwhile, Alex Smith also suffered a concussion, and Nick Foles, who came in for him last week, is already announced as the starter for this week. Uh, let's start with the backs first. I always think of the Chiefs as like a running back factory because basically you were like Priest Holmes. Then you know, like basically they've had unbelievable success developing and, and running with their backs. And Charkendrick West was actually very good last year, sort of over the second half of the season when he became the starter. Uh, is he a good player in his own right? Do the Chiefs just have some sort of thing that makes running backs all work for them? Or, or you know, what are your thoughts? Do you think West will, will be successful in this role for however long he has it? Well, first of all, on behalf of my fantasy team, whose two main running backs are on bye week this week and had Spencer Ware as the bye week sub, I'd like to thank whoever gave him that concussion, by which I mean not thank. Yeah, I think I got that. Uh, you know what? Sharkandrick West was nowhere near as good as Spencer Ware last year. Really? Kind of, I mean, uh, Ware averaged 5.6 yards per carry. West, 4.0. Ware had a 58% success rate. West, 45%. Spencer Ware's DVOA, 26%. West's, 3%. And even as a receiver, Ware was almost nothing last year as a receiver, but West as a receiver, only caught 59% of intended passes. So he had a below average DVOA as a receiver. Interesting. So, no, Ware is better than West. It is it is a downgrade for them to use West instead of Ware. Not a huge downgrade, but a downgrade. Okay. What about the quarterback? So, I mean, Nick Foles has had a total Jekyll and Hyde career. Obviously, he had that huge career year back in Philadelphia. I think that was in 2013. But since then, Foles has just 20 touchdowns against 20 interceptions, and he's completed less than 60% of his passes. Um, I guess that was prior to, to his subbing in last week. I didn't know whether maybe Foles, does he look any better in the football outsider statistics? Or is it also possible that the conservative nature of the, of the Chiefs offense might lend itself to his specific skills? I think the latter. It's less lend itself to his skills. is more uh, Andy Reid does a good job of – setting things up well for backup quarterbacks, partly because the offense doesn't require you to go downfield that much. Yeah. Um, so I, I think Foles will be reasonable. If you look at the, the football outsider stats for him, you know, he was amazing in that one year, right? So, But in the Philadelphia the next year, he had an average DVOA. So he wasn't terrible. But he just didn't do what he did the year, the year before. Right. And then last year he was horrendous, but the Rams' offense was mostly horrendous last year, so that's the shock. So my guess is it'll be about what you would expect from a backup quarterback in the Kansas City offense, which would be if Alex Smith is a little bit above average, then Nick Foles will probably be a little bit below average. And that's no problem if it's just one week and they have to play Jacksonville at home. Big whoop-de-whoop. Sure. Yeah. The problem is if this goes two weeks and now you're going at Carolina and you don't really have the kind of wide receivers who are going to really challenge the problem depth of the Carolina cornerbacks and that front seven is going to just feast on you because, you know, which linebackers in the league would you least want to run a bunch of horizontal five-yard routes against? <laughs> right, yeah, Thomas Davis, Davis for sure, Keekley. yeah. So, and then the next week you play Tampa Bay, and I know that's at home, but, you know, now you're against Levante David, and Daryl Smith is still reasonable in pass coverage. So, 
I think they're fine if this is only one week. I think if it's more than a week, it may be a problem. Okay. Well, you sort of were teasing a a little bit about this, talking about the Panthers. Again, I'm probably delusional, but I need your help sorting out the NFC wildcard picture. I think a lot of the NFC actually is already settled because Dallas, Atlanta, and Seattle, they all seem pretty safe, I think, bets to win their division, and they're all at 80% or higher to make the playoffs in the Football Outsiders playoff prediction rankings. Beyond that, Philadelphia, it's the number one team in DVOA, so I think that puts them in the driver's seat for the wild card. But I'll point out that the record is 4-3, and three, so they're not running away with things, and they play the Giants, Falcons, Seahawks, Packers, Bengals, Redskins, Ravens, Giants, and Cowboys. Is that's the remaining schedule over the rest of the season? We kind of talked about that a couple weeks ago, but man, yeah, is that a tough schedule? They no longer have the hardest remaining schedule now that they took care of the, having one Dallas game. It's now be Washington close. has the hardest I mean, remaining it's, schedule. It's totally brutal. But Phillies is number two. Yeah, I mean, so that's really tough. And even if they're a good team, you could easily see them, you know, only winning half of those games or whatever the case may be over the course of the season. So. It seems like, to me, they're no lock to win the wild card, even if they don't win the division behind Dallas. So the NFC North, um, the playoff odds currently favor Minnesota at 77%. Um, What are your thoughts on Norv Turner's sort of of out-of-nowhere seeming resignation as the offensive coordinator for this team? I mean, the numbers probably aren't going to pick that up, but does that affect your own opinion about whether the Vikings can can win, either win the division or, or get a wild card? Well, usually, you know, the projection systems say that, in general, you take a step backwards when you change offensive coordinators because you have to learn an all-new system. But it's not like they're putting an all-new system in place when they replace a guy in the middle of the season. Yeah. So I don't think that applies. I, I don't know what Pat Shermer brings to the table here. He ran terrible offenses in uh, Cleveland and St. Louis. And then in Philly ran Chip Kelly's offense, which they're not running Chip Kelly's offense in Minnesota now. I mean, that's not going to happen. So I don't know how things get better. I mean, yeah, Norv's whole, like, you know, run the ball and throw deep thing absolutely did not fit with a team whose offensive line is in shambles, especially at the tackle position. But I just don't know how it gets better with Shermer. I don't, I don't know how this makes things any better. That's, that's kind of my, my, my question about it. Yeah. My only two cents on this is that a lot of the press about this offense has been related to the offensive line which obviously hasn't been great, but I think it's worth pointing out that both Detroit and Green Bay are also in the bottom half of the league in in terms of offensive line pressure allowed on their quarterbacks. So it's kind of a problem that everyone in the division is dealing with, not just them. Yeah, the other thing I'd say is, look, the defense is still quality. That's what's going to take this team to the playoffs. That's the way it's been all year. I would be more worried if I was Minnesota about what happened on defense against Chicago that was their best. Uh, sorry, that was their worst single game defensive rating of the year for Minnesota. Minnesota is at one point four percent for week four, but other than that, Minnesota was you know below zero. In other words, better than average yeah. in every game yeah. this year until this week against Chicago. So I would want to find out how on earth did the Bears run all over our awesome front, and can we fix that for the future? Well, the Packers lost a heartbreaker to the Falcons last week. But their playoff odds are still pretty good at 53.3%. But I was wondering whether that was about their chances to win the North itself or how much of that is about their chances to, to win a wild card. Uh, we, basically, we basically have a two-to-one, right? So in about two-thirds of the simulations, Minnesota wins. In about one-third of the simulations, Green Bay wins. It's not quite like that because there's a you know a handful of them where Detroit or Chicago wins. But uh, for the most part, that's basically the split. So... Uh, and then they each have about a 20% chance of a wild card right now. So uh, the thing is that I just, I mean, maybe it's it's not, you know, maybe it's somewhat delusional, but I just have this belief in Aaron Rodgers, despite the whole, oh, Aaron Rodgers is struggling thing. And I do, I have an opinion about Aaron Rodgers that I think falls halfway between what the numbers say and what Kean Fahey says when he watches the film of Aaron Rodgers and just feels like it's not him, it's all the stuff around him. I do think there are some mechanical issues where he's not doing things as well as he used to, but part of the reason why he's doing that is because he's trying to do it all himself because there are all these problems around right. him. But in the end, you know, at the end of the day, I just I have this belief in him <laughs> that 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 he's gonna they're gonna make it to the playoffs because they have the best quarterback in the game or close to the best quarterback in the game. Uh, So, I mean, it may be a 
delusional belief in Green Bay, but I guess I kind of have a delusional be- belief in Green Bay. The numbers don't back that up. The numbers say 50% chance, right? I mean, but... Yeah, I mean, that's still pretty good. I think that still makes the, the Eagles and, and the Packers the top six. like the, the definite front runners in terms of the wild card. But it's not like, oh, absolutely, Minnesota and Green Bay are both making the playoffs, period. And, and that's where, I mean, you throw out the term delusional. Point that finger at me for sure, because I can't help but wonder whether the Panthers aren't actually still in this. Because, no. it, yeah, let me give you my case, and then you can say no after that, okay? There, there's sort of a lot of games this week in particular that I feel like could skew the thing towards the Panthers' favor, because basically the Falcons are playing the Buccaneers, the Vikings are playing the Lions, and the Eagles are playing the Giants. If all three of those favorites win, you're, they're really not a lot of wild card contending teams with good records. The Eagles have a pretty good record, but again, their the remaining schedule is so bad. I think I'm so focused on this because watching the Cardinals game this last week, a either the Cardinals were very unimpressive to me or the Panthers were finally themselves to me. And I don't know how much of that is the fact that the Cardinals kind of had a hangover game coming off that Sunday night tie from the previous week, or whether maybe the Panthers found their pass rush after you know having a bye week or whatever it is. You probably didn't watch any of this game, but is it just way too much of a possibility given that the Panthers are, you know, have five losses already this season? The problem is the AFC West. That's your problem. The yeah, problem yeah. is even if we imagine that the Panthers, uh, right, there's eight games left on their schedule. Five of those games are against NFC teams. Even if we imagine they go four and one in those five games, right, that takes them to six and uh, – uh, sorry – uh, four. If they go, yeah, they're two and five four, right now. Four, four and one, that would take them to six and six. Why am I forgetting a game somewhere? Oh, there's nine. Sorry, they have nine games. They have left. nine so left five. because they had their. So last let's fight. say they go five and one in their remaining NFC games, and that's tough because they have to go at Seattle, at Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let's say they go five and one. That puts them at seven and six. They have to play Kansas City, San Diego, and Oakland, and those are all good teams because the AFC West is the best division in football. And it would be really hard to win enough, you know, even if they're seven and six, they've got to win two of those three AFC games to be nine and seven. And then they have to hope that the NFC East beats each other up enough that nine and seven wins a wild card. That's why we only have their playoff odds at like 5%. I'm absolutely a believer in Carolina being a spoiler the rest of the way, that this team is better than they've shown so far this year. They're 21st in DVOA this year. They were not going to be 21st when the season is over. I think Carolina will be in the top half of the league by the time the season is over. But the schedule just doesn't line up for them to come back and make a wild card Unless they the unless they can really beat all those AFC West teams and win in Seattle and the NFC East spends so much time beating itself up that those teams go eight and eight. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm totally with you. I think the Panthers are probably better than the than at least most of those NFC wild card contenders. I just think there's probably too much damage that's already been done. Given that, is there another you know not Green Bay, not Eagles wild card contender that you think? is interesting to you one that you think could, could potentially you know grab this thing or or are those guys the ones you think are going to win oh i'm so fed up with the freaking cardinals this year i mean this is the team i picked to win the super bowl and instead they're three four and one not to mention that they are the new winner of the longest curse in professional sports award <laughs> congratulations yeah. Chicago Cubs. yeah that's right soon we'll be hearing the dying arizona cardinals fans last request Somewhere Steve Goodman is rolling in his grave at the very suggestion of that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the part of me feels like, God, they're the number four defense in the league by DVOA. All they got to do is have average offense and average special teams the rest of the way. And they're three, four, and one. God, shouldn't they be able to at least put themselves in the conversation? Um, I mean, the Giants have been better at Washington. The problem is that the Gi- Washington has the hardest remaining schedule, and the Giants have the the sixth hardest remaining schedule. But, I mean, th- there's no question that a-, a win or two against Philly for either, you know, the Giants or Washington, you know, as those teams beat each other up, you know, beat, 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 beat each other up in the NFC East, puts one of those teams into the playoff conversation. So, if Washington can win at Philadelphia in week 14. 
you know, then that helps. If the Giants play Philadelphia twice, including this week, I mean, if Philadelphia loses to both the Giants and Washington, then one of those two teams may end up in the conversation instead of Philly. Yeah, I think we're just going to have to wait and see. This might be something we'll come back to multiple times over the rest of the season, unless, especially if that sort of race plays out the way I think it will, which is total chaos. So it could yeah, be there, interesting. There are, there are years where you're like, why is national TV shoving the NFC East down our throats? And this season, it's like, please, national yeah. TV, some good please games. shove Let's do the it. NFC East down our throats. Like, if you can't show us AFC West games, please show us NFC East games. These are good games. Who would have thought we were we would be here? I think last year I was making an argument that that was the worst division in football over the AFC South. Things have definitely turned around for them, for sure. Yeah, young quarterbacks certainly help, don't they? When they're as good as those two, yes. I mean, Philadelphia and Dallas. I mean, Wentz has it. I mean, Wentz has declined a lot in the last four weeks from what he did originally, where Dak has, has, has been still really good. Uh, Wentz has declined. But still, I mean, that's been a huge boost. The Giants and the Eagles had major improvements on defense. And the Cowboys and the Eagles have had the great young quarterbacks. And the Cowboys are much healthier than they were last year. And just the whole division is just much better. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for today's episode of the Off the Charts Football Podcast. Thanks, everybody who listened. And I encourage you to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. And definitely head on over to footballoutsiders.com. Check out the great work Aaron is doing. And check out some of the premium charting data subscriptions that you can get on the site. It's all really good stuff. Otherwise, hope everyone enjoys their Week 9 games, and we'll look to talk to you again next week.